it's been a good week. I gotta be honest with you, it's been a good week, and here's why. On Monday night, which was Halloween, which is really my least favorite holiday, I was in bed by seven, I think it was 47. I was asleep. It was amazing, and I slept all the way until seven the next morning. Um, and that was like the most sleep I think I've received like in forever. And it's amazing when you have just a little bit of rest, how that changes your perspective on all sorts of things. I also, something else is a little confession for you guys. I'm a morning person typically. I love the mornings and I peak about two o'clock and then from two o'clock it's just all downhill. And so uh, as I was thinking about tonight, um, I was thinking yesterday and about one o'clock or so, man, I was, I was stoked. I'm like, we just need to go now. We just need to start right now. And then this afternoon I was reviewing. I'm like, we just need to go right now. I, I was just, I'm jazzed about what we get to talk about this evening. It's, it's life changing. Of course, then as the afternoon went on, I'm like, I'm still excited, but I'm getting kind of tired. But I'm excited, and, and so we're in this series. I, bear with me here. So we're, we're in the series. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about, we're looking at this tree. We're going to do just quick review, because we've got to get to the good, the, that this stuff wasn't good, just we need to get to the good stuff for this evening. And you're, you're the blue thing, the trunk, and you have all these different relationships that, you're, that you may be in or maybe you're not in, but you know, we all have either coworkers or roommates or family or people that we're dating or friends or students. Or, we're in relationship all the time. That's just the, just the fact of things. And a lot of times people are like, man, Todd, when are you going to get to the good, good stuff? And what they mean is like, when are you going to tell us the nine steps to how to properly pursue somebody in a godly way? Or tell me the five tips how to have peace within roommate situations. Todd, give me the three things that I need to do to make sure that at work I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing so I can check them off, check them off, check them off. And we're approaching this so differently because those things don't work. The, the reason they don't work is because then those are just lists that are responsible for you to do your best to try to, to figure it out and try to figure to implement those things. And we couldn't do enough. That's why Christ had to come. And so what we're doing here is we're, you're drawing like a tree with its roots dug deep in. It's drawing nutrients. It's, it's bringing life up. And as it draws from a good source, the tree the trunk carries that out to the branches and things, good things happen. And we need to be doing this. Many of us, we're pulling from the world. We talked about that. We looked at the world's way versus God's wisdom the first night, or really the second night we were talking about this. We looked at the, the left side here, line, divorce, sex, parent speech, how we, the speech that we use, authority, our view of authority. We looked at what God says about that and what the world says about that and how they are just radically different. And we could have gone on and filled up the whole time to sit there and make the case that how God views things and how the world views things, they are not the same. They're not close. They are radically, radically different. But we live in a world, and so the temptation is to kind of start listening to the world as opposed to God. That's the temptation. When we talked about that, there's the big gulf that's fine and dandy. We talked about the world's way. It really it boils down to it's very me-centered and always looking at the temporary, here and now. My kids, man, Paxson right now, he's getting, he's underneath like his extreme jail time because he lied. He thought in the moment, if I just tell an untruth, it'll go easier on me. And he found out that's not, <laughs> that's not how we operate. But the temptation was, if, if they buy it, I won't get in as much trouble. He was thinking out, not as much trouble for me and right in this immediate situation. He's not thinking about overall trust. He's not thinking of the bigger picture. World's way is me-centered, temporary viewed. God's way is looking at him. Some of us don't like that. I don't like it. It's about him because we're me-centered or we have fallen. Anyway, uh, we won't go there in long, much longer term. We looked at these two verses. We're going to come back to them all the time. Here, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's the world's way. It seems right. Everybody else is doing it. It's easy to dive into. The society and the culture that we're in endorses that. But then there's the other extreme, which is God's thing. And you look at Psalm chapter 1, and, and but his delight, the, the man who is, is really blessed, is in the law of the Lord. He thinks about God's way. He will be like the tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Death or life. Death or life. 
death, or life. And we're tempted to go, yeah, 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 yeah. But we've got to get this because this impacts every relationship that we have. And again, world, God, and they're not just static points. We talked about this. Remember, the world is then leading you this way. God is then leading you this way. And you're just getting further and further and further and further and further. So if you're basing your life on the world's wisdom, the actions that you're going to be taking in relationships are going to look radically different than what they look like God's way. And they're going to get worse and worse and worse. Or maybe we'll just leave it this way. I mean, not worse, worse. They'll get further and further and further and further and further apart. And as you look to people around for advice of, man, my boyfriend and I, we've hit a rough spot. What am I supposed to be doing? And they're operating out of the world's way. They're going to be telling you this stuff. You're like, oh, gosh, that sounds really good. But you talk to somebody else who is, like, giving you godly wisdom. Well, that sounds so, oh, well, you say that I'm supposed to be mad and give him the silent treatment. And you say that I can come to him and say I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed by what you did, and I have an open, honest communication. But that might make, that's uncomfortable. I don't like that. He should just know. You know, we'll get to all that later on. World's way, God's way. They lead different directions. And then we talked also about uh, there's this mutant thing kind of in the middle that you're saved, that you've come to like, God, yeah, I, I understand that your son, he came and he lived and he died. That's all fine and dandy. And, you know, he died on the cross for my sins. And then he rose again from the grave. That's all la di da Thank you very much. I'll see you whenever I die. But the world around me, it seems like it just makes more sense. More people are doing what the world is saying. So I'm going to start living that way. And yet, your life won't look fully like the world. It, there'll be little hints of guilt that the other place doesn't have. Little checks of the spirit. And so, but for overall, you'll still be taking this direction. And so you'll look still really far. The Bible talks about that. Uh, people within church, a, a carnal Christian, they come back and talk about that. And the, last week, we talked about our view of God. Um, the world says, man, he's outdated. He's just a mean God. He's so legalistic. And man, he doesn't know us at all. And we looked at how opposite that is from the truth and how that impacts that. And so here we finally are, God of the world. You are there, you are in the middle. You are not God of the world. It's God or the world. You're in the middle. All these relationships, what you're pulling from, man, is going to impact massively how these relationships look. And if we miss that, we miss everything. If we just want nine steps, you've lost already. Tonight we're going to talk about who are you. We're talking about the trunk. Who are you? Now, you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? This, I had to work hard for this. I know it's not that great of a picture, but I got my laser pointer here. So this is a gym. You can see there's a basketball hoop here. There's one here. There's another one down here. And so this gym is in Ames, Iowa, which you're like, great, Todd. Thanks so much. What's so important? Now, there's important things. And this happened at this hoop right down here. This is, this is so important. After my freshman year of college, I came back, and my parents lived in Ames, Iowa at that time, and so I came back, and I love athletics, and so I was like, oh, let's play some basketball. I'm like, okay, so we went down, and you notice these backboards are just a little bit different, and so I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if I could just touch the backboard. I mean, I know I can touch the net, but I wonder if I could touch the backboard. I don't know. You know, the other ones I'm used to are the, the bigger, wider ones that hang down just a little bit lower. This is, I don't know. Is anybody looking? Nobody's kind of looking. All right. Jump. And... To, to my surprise, I could touch the backboard. I'm like, whoa, well, the backboard's really close to the rim. I'm like, what if I could touch the rim? So whoop, come up, boom, I gotta hold the rim. I wonder if I can get it with two hands. Whoo, two, I can get it with two hands. I was excited. I'm like, I never knew I could do this. I had no idea that I could jump that high. Something happened, I tried in high school, it didn't work, but all of a sudden, something in college, Probably some of the tennis workouts I was doing, building some additional muscle mass, helped with that. But all of a sudden, this, this truth of me came to the surface, and I was like, my life is forever changed. And you laugh because, well, it really was. I would try to do layups and do the layup and hit the backboard because I could. You know, because I'm a little bit vertically challenged. You know, most people I talk to, I'm like, hey, it's nice to talk to you. Hey, it's nice to talk to you. It's nice to talk to you. And so basketball is usually a big man sport, so I love the fact that I could get up and I can grab a hold of the rim and... It was amazing, and so that was the first day, but I tried it on this rim, and it worked, and then I tried it down on this rim, and it worked, I tried it on this rim, and it worked, and then I tried it, there's another one down the other side, and it worked. It was amazing. I went back to school at that time. I was going in Missouri, and there was the gym, and they had different backboards, but I wondered, I wonder if I could get the rim here, and so I ran, and jumped. lo and behold, I could get the rim, and it was incredible 
that now that I discovered this truth about me, that I had the ability to jump and grab a rim, and this is very silly, I couldn't get enough of it. I'd visit family down in Texas and see my brother-in-law, hey, Blair, I bet you I can get the rim. Check it out. <laughs> and I couldn't. He, Whoa, how'd you do that? I know, I know. I went over and got a job a little later on in England. And I would play basketball with, with some folks and, and some of the youth. And I'm like, check this out. <laughs> Grab the rim. And they're like, how do you do that? Like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I went down to Australia to see uh, some families that I had worked with. And I was down there. They loved sports. And so there was a basketball rim. I just had to do it. And so I went and I jumped. And wow, Todd, even down here, down under, you're able to grab a hold of the rim. Yeah. It, it didn't matter if it was Australia, England, Iowa, Texas, Oklahoma, Michigan, or Oregon. Every place I went, I was able to jump and grab this rim. I had discovered something about me that I never knew before. I had that ability, and it transformed my life. Who are you? The world's going to define you one way. Do you see yourself as the world? God's going to define you differently. Who are you? If you go with the world, it's going to lead down one way with your relationships that you have, with how you interact with your roommates, with your coworkers. If you view yourself as God views you, it's going to lead a totally different direction. It's going to influence all of those relationships. It's incredible. See, the world's going to say, who are you? They're going to look and say, well, what, what style, what look do you have? You know, how's your hair? What's your income? What's your education? What's your dating, marital status? Uh, let's see, what job, what do you do there? What's your family? What, what's your family background? I mean, these are things that we begin to define people. We do this. Maybe you, you don't. But most people I have met, and when I lived from... Um, as a single within the church, I did this. I'd show up to Junction, and I, and I would just sit there and be like, hey, oh, I, oh wow, I like that hair color. Ooh, pretty eyes. You know, like, oh, pretty. I mean, we just do this. This is how the world operates. We judge people based on the outside. But God looks a little different. But can we get some people here to read? I don't know, you your microphone here. Um, thanks, Aaron. So we got 1 Samuel chapter 16, Verse 7, we, we looked at this verse before, but is it key that we look at this again? Samuel, he's a prophet for the nation of Israel there, and uh, they need a king. And so God tells him to go to Jesse's house, and there he is. And he says, I mean, I'm going to anoint a king. And the first son comes out, and he's like, humdinger, this dude is good looking. He's tall, and he's strong. Woo, certainly, certainly this is the one that God has. And here's God's response. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People look at the what? The or people look at the outward appearance. And but God looks at the, the heart. Okay, good, good. Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. You are those who justify yourself in what? In the sight of who? Justify yourself in the sight of men. men. Sight of People. Men. That's the right verse. You're the one, you justify yourself in the sight of men, but God knows your heart. We go back to Samuel again. Samuel again. Man looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. Let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So, so read it one more time here for me. Sorry. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And most of you are like, man, can't you go on to 17? You, you can go to 17. Can you read 17 as well? Because we're all waiting for it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We no longer live according to the world, the world's way. We no longer operate that way. Man. Man, the world looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. I'm sure we, we are all very godlike in how we approach people all over the place. Who are you? See, if you're viewing yourself only as the world views you, like, 
I am only my haircut and my style, and my physique, my fitness level, my income level, who I'm dating, what I drive, how much money I have, what my earning potential is, that will impact every relationship. Things that you value in those relationships. Well, I don't know if we can hang out. <laughs> you know, I'm finishing up my degree at seminary, and, you know, pastors make a lot of money, so I'm not certain that I uh, can hang out with you guys unless you get your income level up. But looking at the heart, we deal with people radically different. When we understand who God has said we are, it changes everything. Again, Proverbs 14, 12, a way that seems right leads to death. But the man who's meditating, the person who's meditating on what God says people are and who you are, man, there's life. goes on. So who are you? This is bad what's going on. As you turn into Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is a popular verse. Something that's really kind of cool within Scripture. When you read and these letters are written to believers, there's a battle that goes on. And the battle is never like, okay, you need to be this, you need to be this, you need to be this. There's this battle, and it's all about something up, up here. It's about realigning something. So if you've got it, Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, thank you. I, this is such a sweet verse. I also pulled it up here for the New Living. Don't copy the behavior or customs of this world. Don't do it. Don't do that. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It, it is weird. It's a total side story. So I was in London uh, working at a church there. And it's, it's, this will be hard for you to believe as you look at me standing before you today. But I woke up and um, I was like, okay, well, I got to go to church. And I get there to teach the kids and work with the families. And, okay, what should I wear? What do I, what do I wear? So I put on a pair of pants. I put on a shirt. I'm like, this doesn't look right. I took it off. Put on a different pair of pants. Put on a different shirt. Ah! And went for, like, five outfits. I'm like, I'm having a fa fashion crisis. Like, what kind of guys really, you know, do that? It's hard, I know, when you look at me now to see, like, Todd, you're always so confident in the junk you wear. But anyway, I, I was just having this huge identity crisis because I was like, I can't go. I can't go to church looking like this. I work with the singles ministry as well, and there might be some new good-looking ladies who are there. I can't go like this. It doesn't look right. And so I fretted and I worried and I worried and I worried about my appearance externally because I was thinking of myself externally. How often do I stop and go, ah, oh, I, can't, I can't go out and talk to people at Junction. I can't go and hang out with these people because my heart is hard. There's bitterness in there. I, I can't go and connect with these people because who I am on the inside right now, they go, oh, I got issues. I've got sin and I know there's sin. Now, we focus so many times, so much more on what we wear, what we look like, what we're going to say when we see people as opposed to who we really, really are. I buy into that. I can be the only one. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. The old, thing, old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Therefore, what's capitalized there? Yeah, it's okay. Therefore... If. if, okay. You guys are familiar with like if-then statements, yes? Like if this, then this. You're familiar with these things, okay? The, I never like geometry. I think that's not where you usually use it. I don't know. I don't really usually like them. But anyway, in Christ, so sorry. So in Christ you are. And this is a conditional thing all throughout scriptures. It is a conditional thing. In Christ you are something. And that's what we're going to be looking at. This is who you are. If. You are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, this is not who you are. There's a conditional statement. So how do we, you guys tell me, how do we get in Christ? Like, how do we get in? Anybody just shout it out. Believe in him. Sorry? Believe in him. Believe in whom? Jesus. Him, oh, believe in Jesus. What do you mean by that? Uh, accept his free gift. Okay. Okay. Yes, that, I, I will accept that answer. Ding, 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 ding. 
uh, is it that you believe in what he has done and uh, make sure you attend Junction three times a month? This is a yes, no question. No. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, listen, how we get in, it, it's, it's really, the gospel message is tremendous. It really is, and sometimes we forget this, okay? Newsflash, and we'll, we'll look at, I think one of the scriptures here, not very long, but even Paul, who we like in the Christian world, like, well, Paul, he wrote, you know, a big chunk of the New Testament. Okay, so Paul will be like, even, even we, we, he's including himself in there. There was a time when he, when he was under wrath that he was dead. And so we're born, and we're born ruined. And there's nothing that we could do to make ourselves right with God. Nothing. And really what we have had earned or who we were based on that our ruined state of sin soaked in our lives is we were underneath God's wrath. Well, that's not fair. Well, we'll get to that a little bit later on. We were objects of, of, um, of the curse. All relationships, all of a sudden there's tension that starts happening. You go back to Genesis chapter 3 between a husband and a wife. There's going to be tension. There wasn't supposed to be that way initially, but there is now because of the curse. But we were ruined and our destiny was death until Christ came. And he took a place that was yours, a place of death, and offers a place that he had earned. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He's not asking you to do anything other than believe. It's grace through faith. It's not your effort. It's not your energy. It's grace through faith. Who are you? In Christ you are. Here we go. You're alive. Okay, you're alive. Okay, well, what? Well, what? Let's look at, let's look at Ephesians. Like, this gets me so jazzed. I get so stoked. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Paul's writing... And I might make you read a little more. Oh, FYI, so if, if I'm really even slowing down, I just want to introduce you to something. There's a, there's a special guest here this evening. You didn't know this, but there's a special guest. Uh, this is Jimmy Price. Um, I, I brought Jimmy Price for a reason. This is, it was actually, I needed a new Bible years ago. And so I went into, I was living in England. I came back in the bookstore. They had discount Bibles. I'm like, man, I can get a new, brand new Bible, you know, with just maybe a small misprint for like five bucks. Yes. And so I bought it, but it belonged to Jimmy Price. You can still see his name here. It's, it's like, it's, it's on the inside. It has a, a message, you know, Holy Bible presented to Jimmy Price by Martha Price. And then she actually wrote, you know, may we grow closer together as we walk with God. A, a great thing. I don't know why Jimmy returned it. And so I prayed for the prices often. And then I put, oops, okay, that's okay. And then I put it in here, but then presented to Todd Berkey, you know. But I, so... I brought Jimmy Price not just to tell you that story, but what I used to do is every year I get a new Bible, um, and I would work my way through that Bible. And one of the things that I would do is um, I would make it's kind of hard to see, and that's okay. I would just start reading when I would see like in Christ you are, in Christ you are, and so I would just start reminding myself because my mind sometimes wants to go back to my the fashion crisis. Oh my goodness, I'm so ugly. Oh, I'm a double. You know, whatever else my hair when I had hair is out of place. Um, and so I needed to be reminded. And so at the back of my Bibles, what I would do is I would read through Scripture. And I would run across like, oh, wow, in Christ I am. Oh, and I would come back and I would write, in Christ I am. And so what I was going to do, but it was raining, so I didn't want to ruin all my Bibles. I, I was going to bring all of these Bibles that I had over the years that you could look and you could go and you could examine. Like, wow, is he finding the same things or what's going on? And what was interesting to me, um, I haven't forgot about Ephesians, don't worry. What was What's interesting to me is I look back through the years, some of the Bibles had, like Jimmy Price has here, just a whole lot of things that are true of who you are in Christ. And yet there was a year or two when I looked in the back and um, there were only like three things listed. And when I flipped through those Bibles, I was like, well, let me look in this Bible. And I was like, wow, these pages are still really stuck together. Like this Bible never, that year was really a, not a close walking year for me in the Lord. And I started to think about what was going on in my life at that time and how was I living. It was like, wow, the quality of my life really was a little bit less than what it normally was. Huh. It's very interesting to me that I could trace my history through my Bibles, but I, I brought Jimmy, all that to say, I, I brought Jimmy 
so that you can see this is kind of what I, what I do because I need to be reminded of these things. So Jimmy had a, a nice going list here. And so if I'm fumbling around like, man, Ephesians 2 is not supposed to be over here. It's supposed to be over here because it's a different older Bible for me. So anyway, Ephesians chapter 2, I mean, like, thanks, Todd, Jimmy Price. Pray for the prices. I did meet a guy named Jimmy Price. I asked him if he lived in Houston. He said he did. And I said, is your wife named Martha? No, so it was a different Jimmy Price. So um, <laughs> alive, we in Christ. <laughs> What's that? No, I didn't. Maybe he just lied. Not, anyway, so, um, and, well, and, and I will finish by Jimmy Price. So the next, the next year I bought uh, a Bible because I had to pay for a new one. I had it, it shipped in and I had it engraved on the front and I actually had Jimmy Price written on there as opposed to Todd Berkey because I was just weird. And then when I would teach, I would like work with groups of people. I'm like, okay, everybody got your Jimmy Prices. And so there's a group of people who will refer to their words sometime as, you know, Jimmy Price says, um, it's really weird. So, so sorry. <laughs> Uh, in Christ you are alive, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's knock this out. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Man. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Cool, you gave us a bonus verse. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and I, actually, I wanted to, to keep going, but because I knew I would ramble a little bit excited about Jimmy Price. Can you read it one more time? It may actually stop in five, and I'm, I'll probably interrupt you. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in stop. our... Stop. Even when what? Even when we were dead in okay, our Okay, who, who's, who's writing? Who's writing? Paul. Paul. And Paul says, even when we were... So there was a time when Paul was dead, right? And most of us know his story. He came to know Christ in a radical way. So Paul moved from death to continue now. I'm so sorry. Even when we were dead. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It's inc this is incredible. Uh, truly incredible. You and I, before Christ, we were dead. Okay. I'm like, well, Tyler, what do you mean? I, I walked around and I experienced. But no, 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 no. See, we were designed to, to reflect his image. And we, we, are, we really are spiritual beings, you know, kind of having a physical experience in, in a lot of ways. But it, it, it's kind of like this. We, we were just kind of a coffin. And, you know, no matter how much you go and you dress up a, a corpse, and you can take that corpse different places, that corpse is never going to really enjoy, if you take the corpse to dinner, it's not really going to enjoy the things of dinner because it's dead. There are spiritual awesomeness that God has for you and I that apart from Christ we will know nothing about and we'll sit on the outside going, I don't know what you're talking about because we have been spiritually dead. Okay? But then because of Christ we're alive and we can, woohoo, there's things that we can enjoy. But no corpse here can enjoy that. As a matter of fact, they made a movie about this. Uh, Weekend at Bernie's. Has anybody ever said it? It's an older movie. Anybody seen this? You know? And I was talking with people, but essentially the premise is that these guys have to fake that this guy who is dead is alive. And he goes to parties. He does all sorts of wonderful, amazing things. But he doesn't enjoy any of it. He's just, nah, nah, nah. It, that's the reality. Apart from Christ, you were dead. You could do nothing to enjoy God. You could do nothing to improve, like, the quality of your spiritual life. It was only because of God's grace and through Christ that all of a sudden now you are alive. And for the first time, you go, oh, oh wow. Wow. There's so much more going on than, than just this argument that I'm having. Why am I even having this argument with this person? Wow, I am really selfish, and so are they. Well, wow, I'm seeing things in a whole new, whole new perspective. Huh. They're messed up, but so am I. Wow. But I'm not messed up because I'm loved. They don't know any difference. So they're aggravated and they're yelling at me for something that's so really stupid, but they don't know any better because they're, they're dead. They, they're, they're just dead. The world, did you notice a lot of those things? The world looks at your looks, right? It looks at the exterior because the world knows if it becomes, if you begin to look too much inside, they're going to run into a problem that you are self-centered, lustful, angry, hating people who will do whatever you can to get ahead. No, no, that's not really true. Really. <laughs> I'll let you guys talk about that at your table, whether or not you agree with that or not, and that's fine. But left to our own devices, we are me-centered. 
going to skip over keep moving on here. Who are you in Christ? You are forgiven. Oh my goodness. If we can look at Colossians over a couple books in your Jimmy Prices. Chapter 3, 13 and 14. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I might have missed the wrong verse, but that's okay. I think we worked there at the very beginning. Bearing with one another, okay. Forgiving, complaining, against another, just as the Lord forgave you. There you go. Just as the Lord forgave you. Later on, I think there was ah, blasted Jimmy Price. We'll leave it at that. Just as the Lord forgave you. Now, if you walk around with your head held low with a whole bunch of guilt on you, how depressing is life? See, people have a hard time with grace. They really do. If you explain grace correctly, people will turn around and say, wait a second, so you're saying that I'm forgiven for all my sins that I've done already? Yes. You're saying for all the sins that I'll commit in the future? Well, yes. Well, how can that be? Well, when did Christ die? Did he die just yesterday? And so it's only from yesterday and before? No, he died way again. And so, yes, he died for all, all sins. So I can go do whatever I want and there's forgiveness. Yes. Well, I'm just going to go live it up and do whatever I want to do because I can live hog wild and I'm forgiven, right? That's what you're telling me, Todd. Absolutely. That's the magnitude of grace. If you view his forgiveness as anything less than that, you don't realize how forgiven you are. Now, when, when you're unforgiven, a lot of times people are like, I've got to make it up to God. I've got to make it up to God. How can I make it up to God? i got to, okay, okay, I've got, I've really made a mess of things, so I'm going to make it up to you. I am going to go to Junction. And I'm going to go to Junction, and if I do Junction enough, then you'll, you'll, you'll be okay with me. You'll forgive me, right? Or, ah, oh, man, God, there's no way you could forgive me for what I just did, and so I have to make that up. And so I'm going to go serve uh, other people. I'm going I'm to go help people. I've got to help people. That's what i got to do. I've got to go help people. I've got to make it up to you. Or, God, uh, I am carrying around so much guilt, there's no way you could use me because I suck at life. And so I'm not going to do anything because you're mad at me. You haven't forgiven me. When you have talks with other people, when you're talking with folks, and if you know that you have been forgiven, you know the magnitude and the grossness of, of who you were before Christ, but now that you're in Christ, you're radically forgiven, and they wrong you, does it hurt less? It still hurts. But you're able to lavish grace and forgiveness. Relationships, all of a sudden, you can have restoration because you are a forgiven person. You can offer forgiveness. It impacts your relationships. We, we talked about this a little bit. That, that was something that, I don't know if you want to chime in, not chime in. Who are you in Christ? In Christ, you are loved. You know, I... I I look the way that I do, I'm the height that I am because of nothing that I have really done. I should have brought a picture of my dad and put it up here and, and a picture of me about the same age next to him. It's scary. Like it really is, it's scary. Um, and, but there's nothing that I did. There's nothing that I did to try to be, to look this way. It was just a byproduct of having them as my parents. Same thing with, um, oh, what's the, I lived in England, I've forgotten all their names. Who's the, who's the, Kate, and what's her, what's his name? What's his, yeah, yeah, and they had like a kid, right? George Yeah, yeah, okay, so I'm glad somebody's down with this. You know, what, what, did, what did little Georgie, Porgy, what did he do to be like royalty? Nothing, it's just because he was born into that family. And isn't it cool that Jesus says, man, you were born again, it's because of his relationship to royalty, that he is royalty, and because of our relationship to Christ, we are royalty, but we're also loved, we're also forgiven, we are also alive. It's nothing to do with what we've done, it's, what, it's just a fact. You are who you are. Who are you? I am who I am. Who am I? I am alive, I am forgiven, and I am I'm loved. Romans chapter 8, 37 to 39. Read along with this. Holy smokes. Like, seriously, read along with this. Thank you, Candace. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors. Okay, so just, I'm going to stop you there because we usually t talk about this verse. I know I'm so rude about like, oh, yes, you're more than conquerors, which you are. And so we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rah, rah. But keep listening. Continues because she can talk about separating us from something. 
more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Him who what? Who loved us. Okay, I just want to make sure that we understand that it's him who loved us. Okay. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate us from his love? Nothing. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> I don't feel loved. Doesn't matter. You're related to Christ. You are loved. But I don't feel it. Doesn't matter. You are. I don't feel like a Berkey. Doesn't matter. You are. <laughs> you know, Pax, I don't feel like your son. I don't like being your son right now. It doesn't matter. You, you are. You know, because of how you're related. You are love. What can separate you from that love? I'm, nothing. Nothing. Go ahead and read Galatians 2.20, which, uh, before you read it, I'm going to quiz Aaron here really fast. I'm not asking you to actually, like, list it out. But you, did you, when you read this before, have you, had, did you always read it and think about it being related to love? Yeah, me neither. I always read this just about this, our union. But go ahead, and, and I was amazed. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me, for me. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. I mean, this is tremendous, and, and this is hard. I'm going to be honest with you, it's hard. Aaron and I were talking earlier about this as well. So my father has never heard his dad ever say, I love you. As an adult, my dad would call. He, the only reason they had any relationship is because my dad would call him all the time, dial him up. Hey, Dad, how's it going? Oh, you know, the fishing's okay. Oh, great, great. How's Rita? Oh, she's good. You know, how's your dog? He's good. How's the weather? He's good. You know, good, good. Not a whole lot of questions. Hey, Denny, how are things with you? That's just a foreign concept. After getting through kind of a laborious conversation with his father, hey, hey, Dad, uh, I got to go, but I just, man, I love you. Yep, yep. Click. Year after year after year after year after year after year. As an adult, he didn't hear it either as a child. My mom, she, uh, she lost her dad at a very young age, and that radically, I mean, it transforms anybody's life and anybody's family, but it really transformed her mom. Um, incredibly strict woman, not very loving, very kind. And it's amazing to me that these two people, this mom and dad to me, but husband and wife, that didn't really have great role models of what that is like to be loved from a parental figure are two of the most loving people you will ever meet. Um, some of you have had the opportunity to meet Pat and Denny, and they just radiate love. And I know, <laughs> I was talking to my dad, and I was like, Dad, how did, you even, how did you even come to know Jesus? He's like, well, when I was younger, when I was a little boy, um, my parents had divorced, which was kind of rare back in that day, because he's really old. Um, and so I came home, and you know, my dad didn't really always follow through with supporting the family like he was supposed to. And so my mom had to take a job, and so she was always working. So I just had a lot of freedom and got myself in a lot of problems. And, but I was just tuning around. Uh, I don't know if it was on, on a TV or if it was on a radio. I don't want to age him too much. But he stumbled across a Billy Graham crusade that was either being telecast or radio cast or whatever that is. He goes, I, I was just mesmerized by that, and there was a message of love. And I knew right then and there that I was loved, and that God did something incredible for me. The only way that my mom or my dad are able to love the way that they can is because they know that they are loved. Galatians 2.20 told us exactly why. How can we know that we're loved? I, I don't really feel it. Well, okay. <laughs> because life is all about how you feel, right? Yeah, no. That's what the world would have you say. Who loved me and gave himself up for me. My story, um, man, I'm really over it. I'm, I'm really sorry, kind of. Um, Shackleton, is that his name? You guys know that the story of the guy who, uh, the endurance was the ship going down to the North Pole. Is that Shackleton, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're coming down and, 
you know, there's ice. You get stuck in the ice. And if you don't know the story, here, here's the Todd Perky version, which is somewhat factual at times. Anyway, no, it's all factual. So um, the, the ice basically crushes the ship. And so here all these sailors are like, what are we going to do? We're on this block of ice, you know, in a really, you know, Rosie, you've been there. There's a lot of wildlife there, a lot of food, right, easily. Yeah, there's not, there's not a. And so they got to figure out, how, what do we do? You know, they can't just pull out their sat phone. This is <laughs> a while ago. So they hike across. They find, okay, here, here we go. We've been pulling a, a lifeboat with them, essentially. Um, and now they come to one of the, the worst uh, crossings in all of the world, and they're, they're going to do it in this lifeboat. And so it's like he and two other men, they psh, off they go. They leave everybody else kind of in, in makeshift shelters, and they make it across. Woo! But then they were a little off with their navigation and landed on the wrong side of an island. Um, and so they had to then to mountain climb with no real mountain climbing gear to get over to the fishing village on the other side to say, hey, we had a boo-boo and we need help. Um, and so they get there and they say, you know, who are you? You know, well, this is who we are. And, you know, it's, it's crashed. Can you come help? And so they go back and they rescue everybody. Not one man was lost, which was really, truly incredible. Uh, and I've, always, I've often wondered, if risking his own life going, you know, it would seem like a certain death to hop in that little lifeboat and try to cross that stretch of ocean. And then to climb over these mountains, which had not been climbed before with climbing gear, let alone with, well, we got a couple ropes and some sticks. If a year later he came to one of his crew and said, hey, um, I'm just wondering, can you help me with something? If they wouldn't be like, oh, man, you risk everything to save me. I am so, I, I don't feel like helping you right now, but I know what you've done for me. I know that you cared for me. There was some camaraderie that went on there. I, I, yes, let's do it. And I, I think that they probably would. Somebody risked their life for them. And Christ has done that for you and me. We are incredibly loved. Why? Because of who we're related to. Now, that gets kind of tricky when you start telling, well, Todd, these things are true of you in Christ. What about those who are not in Christ? Well, we know the people that are not in Christ, at least they're, they're dead. They're not really experiencing any spiritual things. We know that they're really they're not going to experience any forgiveness. They are underneath God's wrath. But what about love? And that's where you get a whole lot of theological conversations, and I'll leave you with that to discuss your tables. Not really. I'll... God has a love, a desire for all to be saved. And so there is a uniqueness, though, to his love that he has for you and for me. It will never change. Never change. It's incredible. And let me ask you this. If you know, or if a person, that's too personal, you. <laughs> if a person is like, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who spoke and created all these things, loves me loves me. You say it, I believe it. You've shown it through your son. Awesome. I'm in. I am loved. Is that person going to go and like, in my dating relationships, I have to date whoever I can because I'm trying to fill my love tank? Are they operating out of desperation? No. No. The person though, who doesn't believe that they're loved, they're looking for love and acceptance wherever they, wherever they can get it. And typically what will happen is, well, I'll date you for a while, and so I date you for a bit, and this is really exciting. Until the excitement wears off, you're like, well, you're just not the right person. Well, I'm sorry, no, not you, it's me, really, it's you. Let's be honest, because I'm awesome. Okay, so go away, and then you enter another relationship, you're like, oh, this is it. This is what I was really missing. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, you know, it's kind of, it's not you, it's me. No, it's really you. You jump from place to place to place to place to place to place, and you just can't understand, like, what's going on? How come I can't? experience this completion and this love that I see in some other people. It's not fair. I've dated like 85 different girls and yet it's not happening because they don't understand that they are already loved. And they're not operating from a position of already being loved. Already being forgiven. <sighs> Who you are, and I apologize, I, I, I really feel like I have failed on this. The magnitude of who you are in Christ is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And we do this all the time. Eh. Yeah, God loves me. Eh. Yeah, God's forgiven me. Eh. Yeah, God's made me alive. Eh. And when I talk with folks who have that reaction, I get fired up, but also in my heart it saddens a little bit going, they don't know. 
they don't know. There's a last bonus thing. He said, Todd, I'm done with your last bonus things. Um, yeah, well, who are you? are alive, you're forgiven, you're loved. I was thinking about this specifically within relationships. Imagine a relationship is a, is a bridge, because a relationship takes, like, more than one party, right? Like, at least me and somebody else, and then there is a relationship of some sort, friendship, you know, mentorship, friendship, some boat, you know, ship, ship, ship. Um, but imagine that that's this bridge, and so one of the parties, let's just say, is really a strong pillar, like, you know, we kind of see here, it's been specked out, teched out, everybody, it's, it's right. It can withstand the right amount of weight. I mean, it is secure in its identity, that's what it is. But imagine the other side over there is somebody who, those things are just like toothpicks or styrofoam painted to look like concrete. And you hop on your truck and you're driving across that relationship, you know, you're going to get hurt. It's, gonna, it's not going to work. See, when you understand who you are in Christ, I am loved, I'm alive, I'm forgiven, I am stable, there's stability, I am secure. I can be the pillar that I'm supposed to be. I can give the way I'm supposed to give in a relationship. Now, if I'm in a relationship with somebody who's over here who's viewing themselves as the world where I am alive, I am I'm dead, I am unforgiven, I am needy, I'm like a toothpick trying to hold up the bridge. And whenever any tension comes on here, it's going to fall apart. It's most important when you start thinking about, Ty, give us some rules about Christian dating. It's most important. Rule number one, if you want to date, rule number one, understand who you are in Christ. Know it and know it. Know that you're loved. Know that you're forgiven. Know that you're redeemed. Know, <laughs> know that you are more than a conqueror. Know that you've been set free from the power of sin. Know that you're a child of God. Know that you're an heir. Know that this is not the end, that there is a long future for you that is incredibly stable and secure. Know that you've been given everything needed for life and God. Let's know that. And as you know that, you can now operate as the end, end of the bridge that you're supposed to be for this relationship to work. And yet you can be the right individual and still have this thing stink and collapse under pressure because the other person is not right. So if, especially when you're looking at dating relationships, by golly gee, be a good bridge inspector and get to know the other person's spiritual qualities. Get to know, like, man, do you know? Do you mean, you're loved by God. Mm, yeah, I would run the other way. Man, do you know that you're loved? Yes! Oh! Oh! You know, now you've got two stable ends, and that, that is going to be a relationship that can handle pressure, that can handle tension that's going to naturally happen. But if we're insecure in who we are, and we don't believe who we are, we're doomed. And then we'll do this. Well, it wasn't me, it was them. But the reality, and I'll leave you with this wonderful thought that Doug, <laughs> at Bible school, who always talked like this, I, I tell you, when I talked to Doug, I was like, Doug, man, I, I just thought he was like really kind of dumb. But I tell you, when Doug, would he would talk, oh, wow. Profound truths of God. And it really made me laugh because after my first meeting with Doug, I was like, hmm, there's Doug. And I'm like, wow, Doug, someday I, I just aspire to understand God's word like you do. I aspire to know God like you know him, to trust Jesus like you do. It was really funny because I was judging with the world's eyes. Well, I, here he is with just a weird haircut and he talks kind of weird and he just kind of walks kind of weird and looks kind of weird. You know, I was judging purely on that. But he goes, you know, Todd, here's the deal. The, your problem is not your problem. You're the problem. And that's the problem in and of itself. Your problem is not the problem. You are the problem. And that is the problem in and of itself. You don't believe that you're loved. You don't believe that you're alive. You don't believe that you're forgiven. And because you're, you're not secure in that, you take those insecurities into every relationship and taint them and add tension when there's not supposed to be. Let's pray.